Hi, I was hoping to talk to you today about 8th Century Prophets by D.M. Hudna. You might think, well, what the fuck do 8th Century Prophets in Hebrew Scriptures have to do with leftist discourse in the 21st century? As it turns out, quite a lot. Now, the first chapter in this book describes, to a T, capitalism and all of its exploitations. Now, Premnath doesn't use terms like capitalism, but he describes it quite accurately. And the word that he uses is latifundialization. What a fun word, latifundialization. He defines it this, this way. Latifundialization, derived from the term latifundia, meaning large estates, can be generally defined as the process of land accumulation in the hands of a few wealthy elite to the deprivation of the peasantry. Now that sounds rather dry and academic, but it should ring kind of familiar in our ears, being leftists, critics of capitalism living in the 21st century. Now, in the other video, I talked a little bit about how the earliest known passage in the Bible which is the part in Exodus when, you know, the Exodus happens and the Hebrew people are leaving Egypt and Moses is leading them. They part the Red Sea and they escape uh, the Pharaoh and all of his armies. That is the oldest known passage in the Bible. It is the original story. It's a story that lays out a very basic idea of Israelite identity, which is we were slaves, we were once exploited for our labor, and now we are free. And now we live by a law, a law of Moses, which is a law basically for the sake of subsistence farming. And it's no mistake that the Bronze Age city-states on the Eastern Mediterranean seaboard collapsed and that suddenly a whole bunch of small subsistence farms start cropping up in the Eastern highlands east of that in Canaan. The Israelites may have wanted to think of themselves as conquerors. You know, oh, we conquered this land. It was given to us by God. And that's where the Joshua account comes in. But honestly, there's not much archaeological evidence to support that, that claim. It's far more likely that the Israelite people were once slaves of those top-heavy, aristocratic, very latifundial or capitalist city-states. And then they were freed by the collapse, and they fled en masse to the east in an exodus, if you will, to live free. The prophetic voice, or the prophets that you occasionally find in the Bible and the uh, Hebrew scriptures, serve as kind of a, a collective memory of what happened before, as a warning not to go back to the old ways. Oh, no, 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 we were slaves once. Don't listen to the capitalist. Don't listen to the money lender. Don't listen to the person who wants to buy your land. That'll take us back to the way things were before. It was bad. Prophets in the Bible are not really prognosticators who tell the future so much as they are people who remember the past and can see where uh, society is going, whether in a good way or a bad way. More often than not, they are critics of economic systems. And this should make our ears perk up as leftists. Most of the prophets in the Hebrew scriptures, they're kindred spirits. They're critics of capitalism. In fact, I would like to read to you Isaiah 65, verses 20 and 23. And I want you to hear this through the lens of a critique of capitalism. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them, or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands, they will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. 
for they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Basically, life really sucked when they were slaves. Children did not live very long. People did not reach the full life expectancy. They built houses that other people lived in. They planted trees and sowed crops that other people got to eat. It's capitalist extraction of resources that they produced. Like they were the ones who produced, but they did not get to reap the benefits of what they produced. Their labor was stolen from them. That should ring very clear to us. That should be relevant to us. It's a tale as old as time, capitalism. And we have a very, very good critique of capitalism in the Bible itself. And there's a lot more that I would like to say about this. It's probably something that I should leave for another video. But there's some really good stuff in this first chapter about labor and about religion's role in, well, basically selling out the working class. It's unfortunate. Yeah. Needless to say, subsistence agricultural production suffers in a system where, you know, it's no longer just people growing what they need or living off of the land and not worrying about surplus value for commodification. Growing cash crops for export and local consumption adversely affects the production of subsistence crops to meet local needs. In this situation, the peasants are the hardest hit. The people are the ones who suffer the most from the systems of latifundialization and capitalism. There's a lot of really good stuff in here about militarism and how basically militaries were first formed so that they could extract resources by force from their neighbors when the market could no longer be sustained growing cash crops from what land all was already owned. It's all about extraction of surplus and in making the peasants indebted. There's stuff in here about debt. The energies of the peasants are expended between fulfilling their agricultural and corvée obligations, that is, you know, debt. Participation in one does not earn them a reprieve in terms of the other but their performance and productivity suffer in both. When the peasants are dependent primarily upon rain for agriculture, there are serious consequences if rains fail. They are forced to borrow to feed the family. If the rains fail for subsequent seasons, the peasant goes into deeper debt. Often, the peasants may offer either the piece of land they own or an article of value or a member of the family as collateral. Failure to repay mounting loans results in the foreclosure of land and or being sold into debt slavery. Accumulation of land through debt instruments does become a way of creating large estates. Now, it should be noted, this was against the law of Moses. The law of Moses was that each of us would have a bit of land for ourselves, for our families. We would live in a subsistence economy where we lived off of the land and we would have enough and we would get to build our own house and live in it, plant our own crops and then eat them. And no one would be able to take this land from you. It was your inheritance. It was your nahala. That means inheritance or portion. You could not sell your land. You could not give your land away. No one could take your land. That was against the law. But capital does not like that law. And that is where this dreadful cycle of abuse and debt came in. Someone sold their land, or was made to because of something like debt. The prophets speak out against this sort of thing. The religious traditions of the world have a long and storied history of people calling out capitalism for what it is. I think we would do well to listen to ancient wisdom, not for the sake of our souls, but for the sake of, well, realizing that we have more in our toolkit and more ways of reaching out and bringing together the leftist community 
than ever thought before. Leftist unity is possible, and I believe that religion can be a way of making that happen. Because, as we talked about before, religion means, quite literally, to bring together, to rejoin. I think that's something we should be thinking about as leftists. Anyway, I hope to talk to you more about this again later. Thanks for listening.